Hi, good morning to one and all. I, Rituprya Gutu, on behalf of Department of Law, Prestige Institute of Management and Research in Law, welcome you all to the webinar on demystifying the legal aspect of cross-border dispute. We are really uh, grateful to have the resource person for today's webinar, that is Mr. Raghav Pandey. He is currently the assistant professor at Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai, and he is also a visiting fellow at the India Foundation, New Delhi. He is known widely to publish his article in the National News Daily and Academic Journal. And he's also pursuing his doctrinal research from IIT Bombay on the topic of interface of economics and law. We welcome you, sir. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Ritu. I'm very thankful to you as well as uh, the Prestige Institute for uh, having me here for this uh, presentation. I hope to uh, be interesting and not boring during this presentation. I'll be free to take questions. This is a one and a half hour session. Um, I have planned it to be one hour or so, maybe one hour, 10 minutes of my talk, and then subsequently 15 to 20 minutes of uh, questions which I can take. So I'll just uh, start. So the topic is uh, <clears throat> basically the border disputes under uh, international law and I will try and delineate the law on the point and then uh, we will deal with a few cases which have uh, already uh, been decided by the ICJ and then we will we will try and see the, uh, the current disputes and how will they be decided under international law. So what is the significance of border? The, as we all know that uh, after a treaty of Westphalia in Europe, border, the states decided to keep their borders intact. Before that, empires used to rule uh, the world and their, their entire uh, focus was on expanding their borders. All empires looked to gain more and more territory and thereby expanding their borders. So the borders have a very, you know, very high significance. They, they are the boundaries and uh, the states identify and legitimize their rule over that territory through the borders and they signify the rule of one particular sovereign as opposed to others so if they basically signify that this particular of uh, this particular piece of land has sovereignty of one particular state so sovereignty over land is signified by borders and why why do why why are states important states are important under international law because they are the primary actors under international law. So there are basically two, two theories of uh, dualism and monism uh, by which international law is seen to be interacting with the states. Under both these theories, states are very important because they are the primary players. Under dualism, dualism recognizes that uh, uh, the municipal law enacted by say the national law is also very important and international law is also very important. However, they, they are both different and they both operate in different fields and they have uh, sovereignty in their individual realms. Uh, monism in contrast to dualism says that there is a unified system in which in international law is as much part of uh, domestic law and domestic courts can enforce uh, um, monist laws. India, for example, is primarily a dualist country. You cannot go and enforce uh, your rights under international law in, in, say, the high courts or the Supreme Court. You cannot file a writ under 226 to a high court um, enforcing a particular right which you have from an international convention. So it, it is not possible in India. But it is possible in other countries, uh, say, United States of America or the United Kingdom. USA says that the treaties which the US government has signed and ratified, they are, the US constitution says that it is part of their uh, uh, law of the land. So if it is the law of the land, then you can go to a US court, if you are a US citizen and you are, or you are entitled to a right under an international convention, you can go to a US court and get those rights enforced. This is uh, monism in operation. In the United Kingdom also, they have held that international law is part of British common law. And hence, it can be enforced by the uh, courts in England. Pure monism would say that if domestic law is in conflict with international law, 
then international law will prevail. However, that is not the position in most countries where, where domestic law prevails over international law. So pure dualism or pure monism is not there. But what, what we are concerned with today is that the state being at center of international law is very important. If the states are important, their borders are important. And it is hence very important to resolve border disputes through international law. So this, this brings us to the point that there cannot be any territory without any boundary. So in order to have territory, because territory is important for the state, state is important for international law. Therefore, a boundary is also very important. So on what basis does the law determine border claims? Border claims can be based on uh, uh, a list of factors, which we'll discuss now. And law will accordingly determine it. And we'll see how such determination has happened uh, in International Court of Justice. At this point in time, it is also very important to see the nature of international law. International law has been defined variously by various jurists. But an, a very important definition by, say, Austin, I will refer, which, which says that international law is positive morality. Positive morality, that means it can't be enforced. So international law, law the subjects are states, states are sovereigns, and sovereigns cannot be dictated by international law. So international law just provides a direction and... Uh, you know, uh, gives an idea whether the actions of a particular state are legal or not legal. But it is very difficult to compel compliance, especially if they are very strong states like say, the permanent members of UN uh, Security Council, say China, US, UK. It is very difficult to compel compliance in terms of international law from states. So the point is that international law has its own limitations. And we need to see what the position of international law is, is in the context of the limitations of international law. We will see in individual cases also. So borders can be claimed on geography. It is very easy to claim a border on geography. For example, Himalayas are a border between India and uh, China, India and Nepal, because uh, they separate uh, these two countries. Rivers can be boundaries. These, these are very easy to demarcate. Uh, and basic and to claim culture that a particular country has a particular culture so if another uh, another territory has similar culture then the other country can claim so we can uh, see this by russia's annexation of crimea crimea had a crimea was in ukraine which was annexed by russia a few years ago and uh, the basis was that crimea has uh, primarily russian population so on the basis of culture. This is very closely linked with uh, demographics, but demographics also encompasses uh, religion, linguistics. And it, on the basis of a particular uh, demographics of a particular territory, a border can be claimed or a territory can be claimed. Historical claims. This is uh, possibly the most important uh, category of claim that, you know, in our history, we used to rule that particular uh, a piece of land and therefore the current uh, government is also entitled to uh, get that piece of territory and hence we will we are entitled to shift our border there this is very important in the context of uh, china which primarily bases its claims on the basis of its history we we'll, we will see all of this in very great detail possession so if you if you possess a particular territory like in uh, property law you you are entitled to keep it and uh, draw a boundary around it. Uh, legal instrument. So if you have entered into a treaty with a particular uh, country that this piece of land should be given to this particular country, then uh, you can base your claim on the basis of an international legal instrument. Can there be any hierarchy in all of these uh, uh, claims? Uh, the only hierarchy which we see in the ICJ statute is something we will also see it here. This is uh, Article 38, and it uh, gives a hierarchy in terms of sources of international law, which the ICJ should use while determining a legal dispute. So th this will give you an idea that how uh, uh, a particular claim based on a particular source of law can be given priority over the others. So the court says, uh, the, the statute says that the first in priority is international conventions. These can be treaty laws, 
uh, and they should be placed at the highest priority. So if, if there is a written uh, international legal instrument and if there are rights being derived out of it, then that should be given the highest priority. It is another matter we will see that uh, if you were a party to it or not, then there is international customs. Cus customs, uh, you can better understand customs as uh, say, Riti Rivas in uh, Hindi and uh, you know that, uh, for example, uh, no incestuous marriages happening happening under personal law, having no legal validity. The, there are also international customs that how states behave in a particular manner. So, so if if a particular country has been using a particular shipping route through through its history through a very long period of time, and other states have acknowledged that uh, uh, route then uh, that is something which will be protected by international custom. It, it, it uh, developed a right over a period of time. Then there is uh, general principles of law recognized by civilized nations that uh, a, a set of law, for example, a set of laws, for example, constitutionalism is something which uh, is identified by most civilized countries, rule of law. These principles are identified by most countries as very basic to be included in uh, a dispute, a dispute should be decided on the basis of these. Then judicial decisions of you know, domestic countries and uh, opinions of jurists, these are also very important, but as you can see, these fall down on priority. And then there is a provision of ex equo et bono, that means on the basis of equity, justice and good conscience, what we know today in India's jurisprudence, then the court has authority to decide on these also. But the, these, this is hierarchical. If there is a claim based on an international convention and another claim is based on an international custom, then the claim based on international convention will prevail over a claim based on international convention. And um, likewise. So we will examine each of these uh, uh, sources uh, in detail so as to understand the disputes which we will refer later. So treaties are easily the most legal uh, way to claim a particular border because it has been recognized in, in a written letter. So it is very easily legally enforced, but it has less human and uh, emotional appeal like history and geography have that you know, the, the sacred idea of um, motherland, you know, Aryavarth of India, because it is surrounded by uh, Himalayas, having rivers and having oceans below. So this is something uh, uh, which is more legal, but less emotional. So this is problematic in a sense that countries entered into treaties because they were colonial they were ruled by colonial powers or they were afraid of colonial powers and uh, they were basically the claim is that uh, treaties were uh, entered into uh, under coercion. So this is something which China routinely uses that uh, uh, something which was done by a colonial power will not recognize it. So the McMohan line is a, is a uh, glaring uh, example which was enforced by uh, the British over China. Uh, and it was a border between Tibet and India. Uh, and uh, interestingly, the Dalai Lama who, who lives in India has also refused to acknowledge McMohan line. And uh, it was only acknowledged in, in, I think, 2008 by Dalai Lama that it, it should be the border. Otherwise, the entire uh, area of Arunachal Pradesh is claimed by the Chinese on the basis of the claim of Tibet that it is part of Tibet. We will also look at this dispute in detail. Uh, another problematic feature of a treaty is that this signifies border at a particular point in time in history that when, when the treaty was uh, executed, uh, for example, it was done in 1901, then the border is signified at that point in time and not before or after that. So this is a, a problematic feature of this source. Then execution, how do you execute a treaty is again problematic. Can you use force or you cannot use force, but you can definitely have more force to your argument when your claim is based on a treaty. Uh, 
the next important source is geography which says uh, say a mountain range rivers as we as we already discussed uh, it is very difficult to dispute that uh, india has routinely claimed territory which is on this side, on our side of the himalayas and that is primarily the basis of all our claims um, with china especially uh, in the northeast as well as in the aksai chin region in the in ladakh is based on uh, geography and in addition to other other criteria this is very difficult to dispute because uh, geographical features do not move as easily they are there um, but they can still move for example rivers can move very easily so what will you do then then it will create a problem this is also very uh, convenient because it provides a buffer zone uh, which is basically a no man's land so if you if the river is a border then each side will start their country from the bank of the river 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 itself will remain a buffer zone but yes the problem again is of precision so you you are not sure from where exactly does india start or china end or china starts and india ends because the entire range of himalayas you are considering border uh they are easily to man easy to man no, no patrolling is required because the geography is separating the two countries there is a buffer zone so no patrolling is required they they have a military advantage as well so it is not very easy to surpass these geographical barriers so you know if you are following the news today we we are claiming that you know india is better placed to take on the chinese on the in the ladakh region because we have uh, better trained uh, mountain divisions in our army to handle the uh, chinese there and it is also because of the geography which suits us this was also uh, a presumption in world war 2 where these ardennes forests were there in france and french presumed that it is a geographical boundary and fr from where the german attack cannot happen but then uh, they, they were mistaken uh, the german attack happened through the ardennes but nevertheless it has a military advantage it is very difficult to you know stream roll your army through a through a forest or a river or uh, through the mountains economy so you th th this can also be a basis of claim where uh, you need territory for economic activities uh, especially if you are a say a land locked country you need access to sea uh, which is uh, which is a very reasonable claim to make then you can claim territory to uh, have natural resources uh, japan attacked uh, china uh, you know before just before world war 2 and during world war 2 because it wanted the natural resources in uh, the manchuria region of uh, china because it was rich of it had rich natural resources and japan had none access to ports is very important to in order to trade and hence you can claim uh, territory which has ports you can off late you can also claim a particular ter territory because you have economic relations to them uh, so for example uh, just before uh, partition of uh, india uh, both uh, you no know, cotton and jute industries in east bengal and west bengal suffered because uh, majority of the, the agricultural produce was happening uh, in east bengal and it, it the industries processing it was in were in west bengal after partition both both of these basically collapsed because they had very strong economic relations and now they it was gone so if you have a very strong economic relation with a relations with a particular territory you and uh, states are known to claim them culture no it is it is a very very uh, important factor in uh, claiming territory that you you have same ethnic relations uh, ethnicity uh, to a particular territory crimea is one example as i uh, had given yugoslavia disintegrated because it was a multi ethnic country and uh, the current conflict in uh, kosovo serbia and all of these countries has uh, entire uh, uh, basis of claims in ethnicity and culture language religion also play a very important part pakistan entirely was claimed on the basis of religion 
you know the, the demands of independence initially just after our independence in northeastern region say was of independent naga land was because they wanted a country for nagas naga are an ethnic group uh, entire politics of alpha in assam was uh, on the basis of ethnicity but different different regions of the world have different uh, markers of culture for example europe has language as the mar- marker their uh, religion is the same but the states become to be uh, became to be identified through their languages for example france uh, was claimed on the basis of french language it italy on the ba- reunification of italy happened on the basis of italian language germany was splintered into m- many different countries say prussia and it was united into one single country of germany because they were all germanic states german speaking states uh the rule of self determination is entirely based on this uh, concept of culture so it is more often than not if uh, there is a referendum in a country people are likely to vote to go to a country where they identify with their own culture it can be based on any of these factors control so if if you control a particular uh, territory then you are entitled to keep it uh, this is much like possession in property law uh, which yes, some of you may have studied or you will be you will study this is a very important determinant very strongly linked with sovereignty if you exercise sovereignty then you have control over that piece of land and the problem in this is that what is the standard of control what kind of control do you consider valid to justify a claim so tibet and china is a very pertinent dispute on this point tibet was nominally under the control of the chinese which they kept losing and kept winning over the period of history but then china continued to claim tibet on the basis of their nominal control so they they did not have basically tibet was sovereign but still china claimed emerging from control is a concept of uti posidaitis is is it is basically inheritance from colonial power so whatever british india had in possession the current republic of india is also entitled to possess those so this this is basically in contradiction to rejection self uh, deter- the rule of self determination so you can uh, see this uh, in kashmir for example kashmir can't be independent because it was under the rule of british so it should go to either pakistan or india but currently the control is with india so it's not going anywhere and uh, on the basis of self determination this principle of ut posidatis is criticized that it, is, it does not encompass self determination it is enforcing the rules and borders which have been uh, mandated by the fo- former colonial power <clears throat> historical claims uh, are uh, uh, very important and they are also very frequent they, they are the most frequent perhaps and uh, this is uh, very much opposed to control so if even if you're not controlling you can say that we used to control and hence uh, there is always an underlying claim even if someone else is controlling the territory you can say that we used to control and it is hence it is our own uh, territory therefore this has an underlying character um this is based on the first in time argument that we had reached here first and ruled here first and therefore we will sh- we should also rule it again this can very easily be relatable to culture but because if you have ruled a particular country you can uh, have you can witness your culture over there this is uh, something which you can see if you if you visit uh, south east asian countries you will find a lot of lot of south indian culture over there which is because the cholas used to rule there and uh, therefore they have left their culture over there this is the most uh, common criteria of claims you can also claim a particular country on the basis of ideology this is uh, you know the concept of motherland mother russia akhand bharat and uh, israel uh, the entire entire basis of their claim is ideology because they said that our religion germinated in that particular piece of holy land and therefore we should uh, 
be entitled to uh, rule it crusades happened because of ideology that we wanted to we want to conquer this particular piece of land because that is the mandate of our religion so the, this can also be a basis of claim so the, these are various uh, categories in which states have based their claims however we we have to see if these are conflicted what will happen so we will see this case this is basically a case from 1953 between uh, france and uk and uh, this very closely relates to uh, the senkaku islands dispute uh, in japan currently and we will we will see that dispute as well so these are uh, an island groups uh, group uh, in the english channel you can see the map over here this is uh, france and these these two islands which are highlighted in red are these islands which are uh, uh, contentious and the subject of the uh, case <clears throat> so what are the issues issues are uh, treaty law versus history versus effective control british ex exerted the sovereignty over the, this piece of land they said that <clears throat> that we have judicial proceedings going on over there there are local ordinances governing that piece of land we conducted a census over there and the property is registered under british law there are british officials who are conducting registry of property over there france said that we have historic rights you know since duchy of normandy so they 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 had based a claim on the basis of history there was no treaty involved so the entire debate was whether control should precede a claim based on history or a claim based on history should precede a claim on control uh, in this case the court decided that control will overrule history so if if you have current control over that particular piece of territory then you will continue to have it history will not come into your way this is uh, uh, something which the court ruled as you can see this jersey is uh, is a british island which is you know uh, far from relatively far from uh, uh, the british mainland and these islands are very near to france so it is very uh, it can be very easily argued that france must be given these uh, islands because of proximity and uh, as you can say the, the the scale is uh, very very uh, small so they are very near to the french coast and they they have been fishing around them and all of that so Fr france had a very decent claim but since uh, the uh, the british had control over these islands the courts gave it to the uh, british side then the, again uh, this case came between uh, belgium and netherland and it concerned with the uh, itself with a border dispute there was a convention this is uh, the 1843 boundary convention which had given it to belgium and it was contended by netherlands the giving of uh, uh, this these enclaves the, these are basically enclaves uh, just like india and bangladesh had enclaves uh, with uh, each other and they recently i think four five years ago they agreed to exchange them and uh, our uh, dispute with them was settled and uh, netherland based their claims on the basis of control so this was after the convention was uh, 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 had come about the netherlands was registering births deaths marriages collecting land taxes and everything so they they had very effective control of, over these territories but uh, belgium also had included this territory in their military maps and the, their their basis was uh, this boundary convention uh, netherland argued that you know both of us who were given a copy of this Uh, convention maps annexed to this convention were different so netherland was given a different copy of maps belgium was given a different copy of maps uh, which was indeed true that they, they were slightly different but netherland was not able to prove that what you are claiming as yours was included in the map which was given to you so they were not able to they, they proved that there was a mistake but uh, uh, they, they were not able to prove that the mistake did indeed give uh, uh, that territory to the netherland so
argument was data so uh, you are not supposed to draw a claim from that so the uh, the court ruled in favor of belgium then uh, there there was there is this uh, very famous case of temple of priya vihar uh, which is uh, which formed the basis of dispute between uh, cambodia and thailand um, Thai, thailand claim was based on a watershed line which is a geographical feature watershed line means the area from where the water uh, which serves as the catchment area for a river where the water from where the water flows to a river so this is the basis of the thai claim and uh, cambodia was ruled by france and uh, france had entered into a treaty which recognized that the border should be based on the watershed line th which thailand is claiming the the treaty also recognized that watershed line should be the basis of uh drawing the border this is between french french government and uh, uh the thai government Sa siamese are is basically formerly known uh, the thai the thai uh, thailand country was previously known as siam, siam. and um, it gave the authority this treaty gave the authority to draw the border with mixed boundary commission so it this treaty established that border should be based on the watershed line but it will be drawn by mixed boundary commission however mixed boundary commission did not exactly follow the watershed line and gave this temple which is on the border to cambodia both countries after that adopted the maps uh, thailand did not inspect it and protested it so it was given to cambodia and thailand accepted it and did not uh raise any contention and it continued to use the maps so therefore a claim based on geography which is the watershed line of thailand was defeated by a claim based on treaty which is this uh, treaty and uh, the mixed boundary commission subsequent to that you can see the dispute over here this is the red red is the watershed line which will naturally include the temple uh within uh, the boundary of thailand the international border of thailand however if if we were to follow the border it would include the temple in cambodia now we will come to since you have seen that how uh, the courts have uh, dealt with the uh, the priority of uh, claims so in this case uh, geography could not defeat an argument based on treaty uh, we will see on what basis we can see the current disputes which um, india is in and other disputes as well particularly focused on china so aksai chin is claimed by india on the basis of a johnson line a johnson line which is again based on the principle that you know british drew that line and we are the inheritors inheritors of that country uh, of the colonial rule and we should therefore uh, also uh, subscribe to this uh, not just johnson line which was drawn by the british in fact postal atlas of china which was published by government of china recognized it from 1917 to 1933 and it recognized the johnson line which is uh, which has included aksai chin in indian in india uh, this was also uh, used by peking university atlas it also gave aksai chin to india even historically indian claim is also very strong uh, maharaja of kashmir uh, constructed a fort at shahidullah and this is a place which is beyond aksai chin and which is also not claimed by india anymore this is not uh, there uh, in uh, india's uh, territory so this is this is somewhere in the shaded region which you will find the the pink line which is above kashmir as we know it jammu and kashmir this place shahidulla is here and not not just in aksai chin so indian claim on the basis of historicity is much beyond even what we are claiming today uh, china is known to uh, you know give uh, chinese names to every place and they 
the shahidullah was con- converted into zaidullah and this is like i like we said you know, this is beyond johnson line and uh, maharaja of kashmir had control over that territory it is signified by having a port over there um then there was uh, the the entire basis of claim of china is based on mccartney and macdonald line which uh, gave excise into china but then it has a very important context and which is very important to understand in order to decide the claim this is uh, the context is of the great game great game is a historical period in which uh, the british empire and the russian empire were fighting each other so across the world there was a very major conflict between russia and uh, britain this was much like the cold war between uh, soviet union and uh, uh, america but it also involved some small scale battles also uh, major battles also but not directly with the uh, britain british empire and the russian empire so russia and uh, britain were very much insecure with each other and uh, therefore Brit- british rule in india was also you know following that policy and as we know that uh, india was the crown jewel of british empire so it was m- even more insecure about uh, you know any interference uh, from any other foreign power in uh, india so they thought that russian empire could approach india from the top and therefore it would make sense to give this barren region to china which will serve as a buffer and if in the in the event if they attack the chinese will face the brunt of the russian invasion first and in the meantime the british army could reinforce itself to defend the border so this is the context however british did not abandon the johnson line even though mccartney macdonald line came later Uh, the johnson line continued to be used by the british even after world war 1 so this was uh, all throughout reminiscent uh, in uh, the maps drawn by british india the the claims based on the johnson line John, so uh, india's claim is very much uh, based on something which is uh, say a treaty law or a written legal instrument which should uh, overrule ideally the claims on uh, the basis of uh, history or control china is basically has no claim over no uh, basis of any claim over aksai chin it is just uh, 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 you know a method of saying so there is no no concrete claim by the chinese uh, okay now we we will also look at the dispute in the north eastern region which is uh, which also uh, formed uh, part of the 1962 war and uh, you know british india britain china and tibet sat down and formulated a uh, shimla convention though later on china withdrew from it and the convention was uh, uh, between tibet and india and uh, they published published uh, uh, the macmohan line in uh 1937 and uh, uh, it was uh, not explicitly rebuked by the chinese and the entire basis of claim of china was that tibet is an autonomous uh, region but it is is still part of china so it is uh, it is not empowered to uh, enter into a treaty with another country so this this has a context of british invasion into tibet so Brit- britain which basically used british indian army to attack uh, to attack tibet and all semblance of control of the chinese was uh, removed from tibet and tibet basically became uh, a Br- Br- british ruled territory and then it, when it vacated it basically liberated tibet and then concluded a treaty with tibet china's claim is again based on the basis of an edict from king dynasty king dynasty is is uh, is an old dynasty and they are basing their claim on the basis of an edict so imagine we basing any any our claim on the basis of ashokan edicts that ashoka said that we used to rule on these these particular pieces of land so today india should also have those lands that is the uh, basically a very absurd uh, 
argument to make in international law but then again as we said that that is the nature of international law uh, states are independent means and they can make any statement whatsoever so they then that has no had the treaty making power it was our state this is like uh, uttar pradesh concluding a treaty with nepal which is obviously not possible so this is what china is trying to argue but that is not uh, true tibet uh, was an independent entity at that point in time so this this can be equated to you know india basing its claim on uh, the basis of chola empire or mauryan empire we we will see just to see how ridiculous can uh, we sound so this is mauryan empire for you so we can claim most of uh, afghanistan and also claims on the basis of uh, mauryan empire which is uh, we we can consider that current indian an inheritor of this uh, uh, empire and you can claim entire nepal bangladesh parts of uh, entire bhutan and also some parts of uh, yunnan province of china also now this is something you can easily do if you were to argue like china um uh in fact uh, i have not included a map by the Cho of the chola empire so if you if you are basing your claim on the basis of uh, the territory is ruled by Cho chola empire you can claim entire malaysia indonesia singapore all of these con uh, countries should be part of india if you if you are you know if you want to argue like china uh you know china has uh, 18 Uh, border disputes with 80, border disputes with 18 of its neighbors uh, a lot of it are uh, sea disputes so it is also uh, you know relevant that we examine uh, what are these disputes also uh, as opposed to land if your land boundary is fixed then there is a very very major clarity on what your sea boundary will be so if you if you have a fixed land boundary the the sea boundary is fixed by united nation convention on law of sea which is uh, which is the foremost law on that issue and it overrules any historical any cultural any sort of other claims so <clears throat> the, the, these regions are divided in uh, 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 under the convention uh, territorial sea extends from uh, uh, the land to not land but baseline to 12 nautical miles uh, a distance of 12 nautical miles then there is a contiguous zone then there is an exclusive economic zone and after which there is high sea uh, th th there is different legality in all of these regions but uh, th th this basically evolved because uh, richer countries wanted to have lesser sea boundary so that they are able to exploit the sea routes of uh, the entire world so these um, you know, the british history or even the us history is very majorly their maritime history very a very major part is played by their maritime history so they they are uh, they they have no, in their history they are known to use sea routes to their advantage it was through sea that britain reached all across the globe and ruled it they wanted very lesser sovereignty on sea of all countries so that they are free, free to use uh, uh sea for their navigation this is what richer countries developed these are you poorer countries and you know, smaller countries wanted larger and larger sovereignty over sea so as to exploit sea for its resources so this convention was you know the result of these two conflicts and negotiated sovereignty in the form of exclusive economic zone <coughs> evolved i will just uh, tell you in brief what is the um, uh, legal characteristics of these uh, regions <coughs> internal water waters are behind the baselines baselines are basically uh, you know if you have a truncated uh, board, uh, sea border then you draw a baseline of simple simpler border around uh, your uh, land and sea interface and the water which is trapped inside the baseline is known as uh, internal waters internal waters are basically entirely considered to be land there is no innocent passage so no country can you know no no ship 
no foreign ship can come and pass through them without your permission territorial sea is also basically land but there is also a freedom of uh, innocent passage and uh, contiguous zone is a place which is slightly different wherein you can enforce your laws but it can't be invoked for for example if a crime is committed in territorial sea you can arrest the person in contiguous zone but if the crime is committed in contiguous zone then you can't arrest that person so this is uh, this is a, a very uh, concept of a truncated uh, sovereignty exclusive economic zone has uh, that the 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 country which whose economic zone it is has liberty to go and uh, <clears throat> mine for oil and natural resources fishing and all of that and other countries don't have uh, uh, those rights but they have a right to uh freely navigate these waters so this is a truncated concept now these these boundaries as enunciated by the united nation convention of law of sea will overrule all all other such conventions this is another uh, figure to just to tell you that how the legality of uh, this convention operates uh even above uh, exclusive economic zone you can see there is international air space so so the, the country whose land it is cannot control the air space and um, uh this is also true for the contiguous zone Ex national air space only extends till the boundary of territorial sea i'm not going into great detail you can probably uh, do that yourself it's not so difficult so we we will come to the dispute in south china sea so china claims territorial sea which which you can see by the red line the red line is the line which china claims as, as its territorial sea you can see that uh, under united nation convention on law of sea you can only claim it till 12 nautical miles however it is claiming uh, china is uh, absurdly claiming it till almost uh, malaysia brunei and you know, hundreds of nautical miles nautical miles it is claiming its territorial sea not exclusive economic zone these these are uh, claims by different uh, countries and they they also formed a part of uh, uh, of an international arbitration at the it loss we will uh, have uh, a look at the judgment also so this is just to give you an idea that how china is claiming so this claim is on based on what basis the claim is based on this is the chinese claim the red dotted line this is based on the basis of uh, uh, a nine dashed line what is nine dashed line it is nothing it is just what only the chinese know what is the nine dashed line that is in their history that they have controlled this part of sea so they will keep controlling it even today that is what their argument is without any respect to inter, uh, what what is unclause saying uh, what is the convention how is international law operating they have basically no regard to it uh, the blue dotted lines which you are seeing is the exclusive economic zone border of different countries uh, china is claiming not exclusive economic zone it must be stressed and you must note that it is not claiming uh, Uh, the exclusive economic zone instead it is claiming territorial sea so it is entire total sovereignty of uh, china over this part of sea whatever unclause is saying uh, china is not concerned with that so this came up before the uh, 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 it laws international tribunal on law of sea and uh, this was a, a basically an arbitration and china naturally withdrew from it Uh, but uh, it has important repercussions on what is the legality of this uh, nine dash line so uh, it has it was remarked by the court that uh, the scope of maritime entitlements cannot extend beyond the limits of what has been given under unclause convention so the con unclause is the final authority if if your claim fits under unclause only then you can claim it you there is no uh, scope of any other claim 
that is the first assertion the second assertion is that historic rights or other sovereign rights of jurisdiction by the relevant part of 9 dash line are contradictory to the convention convention is unclause so this is um, without any lawful effect and the extent and they exceed the geographic and substantive limits of china's maritime entitlements under the convention so basically the court is saying that it is illegal and it is important to note that it has said that convention unclause has superseded any historic rights or other sovereign rights so even even if you actually uh, have uh, these uh, uh, rights you are not entitled to them anymore you used to have it but you will not have it anymore because there is a convention which will govern your rights and duties then there is another very important uh, dispute which is happening in east china sea this was south china sea then there is east china sea uh, china is uh, disputing everywhere so it is quite reminiscent uh, these uh, relate to the senkaku islands this is between there are three parties taiwan china, republic of china uh, which is republic of china and then people's republic of china which is china mainland china and japan these uh, islands were uh, claimed by japan because when they said that when we used we surveyed it in the 19th century it was terra terra nullis that that is it be, it be used to belong to no one and therefore we claimed it taiwan and china both claim that this is uh, there is documentary evidence preceding that survey and hence uh, our claim is there the these were occupied by japan since first sino chinese war so the chinese sino chinese this is the uh, J japan and Chi chinese fought and uh, this is sino japanese war not sino chinese sino means china so sino japanese war this is a typo and the china was defeated and japan occupied these islands it remained under its possession and then the possession was transferred to usa and usa vacated in uh, this was because of world war 2 usa vacated its position in uh, 1972 the position then was again transferred to uh, japan uh, the basis of uh, chinese claim is treaty of shimonoseki i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly but that is what the name is in this treaty which was concluded in the aftermath of first sino japanese war uh, china agreed to cede formosa and appurtaining islands formosa is current taiwan it was previously known as formosa and appurtaining islands so this is very close to taiwan you can uh, see it here that these this is the location of uh, senkaku or diaoyu islands senkaku is the name given by the chinese uh, the japanese diaoyu is the uh, name given by the chinese so it is very near to taiwan uh, china says that under this treaty we for we had given away our claim to formosa and we had ceded and appurtaining islands which included senkaku islands uh, interestingly japan is saying that no this treaty the appurtaining islands do not include uh, the senkaku islands and uh, therefore we do not have to give it back because it was in the aftermath of a war you have forcibly taken from us in in this war and therefore you need to give it back that is what china is saying japan is saying that no appurtaining islands did not include senkaku islands because they were terra nullis and it it was our survey there is documentary evidence for that in japan then there was treaty of france uh, san francisco this was in the aftermath of world war 2 where japan lost and all the territory was basically even the japanese homeland was uh, ruled by usa and so was uh, senkaku and uh, china is basing its claim again on the basis of rule by king dynasty so again there is uh, this uh, basis of claim uh, on the basis of historicity but you know not of this particular uh, 
Chinese Republic, but again, a, a dynasty which ruled uh, previously. Uh, Japan has been ruling on these islands before, before you, of course, before USA came in in the aftermath of World War II, and it had law. Even today, it has law enforcement over there. Collect, collects taxes, does registry and everything. The, the Japan has control, and uh, basically, you you know, we need to contextualize that the dispute has arisen. It would not have arisen. Uh, had there been no discovery of oil reserves. So oil reserves were recently discovered around these islands and hence the entire dispute has come about. But again, the, the conflict is based on control versus historicity. Historicity is not so strong here. So you, can, you cannot claim the entire world if you, you were, uh, you know, if you are, for example, the British, you, you ruled almost uh, half of the world. You cannot claim it today. So uh, this historic claim is also misplaced. It can, can't be called his, uh, historic claim. But, and the Japanese claim is based on uh, control. So naturally, control will always uh, supersede historicity here. So yes, uh, I think I have uh, covered all these uh, disputes and the law around it. Um, I will be happy to take questions and uh, anything uh, which you would want to ask me. Uh, if any student has any question, they are free to ask. I think so, Muskan. Two students have raised their hand. I'll just allow them to speak. Sure. All right. So Muskan is there, Ritu. Yes, sir. Muskan, Muskan, you can speak. Muskan, you have to unmute yourself. 